You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku. Glad to be here once again. Um, we're going to discuss a, a, a topic that is central to our current existence under the uh, occupation or, dominate, or domination that we are currently under. Um, before I get into today's show, let me get back to my, my free business shout-out. Remember, um, if you or someone you know owns a black own business and would like to get a free business shout out here on the bitter medicine podcast please have them contact us at bitter.medicine.podcast at gmail.com that's bitter dot podcast oh, sorry bitter dot medicine dot podcast at gmail.com I can't stress to you how frustrating it is that I've only in the time I've been asking for these uh for these uh for this business information out here how many times have I only been able to read one business on this podcast it's a shame to me that you guys either don't own businesses that are black owned or you have no friends or family who owns black businesses, and that kind of ties in with today's show. When you don't have a black business or black businesses in your black community, who do you think are the business owners in your community? So when these business owners and these businesses play a fool with you in your community, then what? Then maybe you'll run to some, some periphery black business to support for about a day and a half. That's what we're going through currently, and that's going to be a big part of the discussion tonight. But let me uh, continue. Today's free business shout-out goes to Stephanie Renee's Salon, located at 1614 West Main Street, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 49006. That's the zip code. If you want to give them a call, you could give them a call at 269-343-4007. That's 269-343-4007. That's Stephanie Renee's Salon. It's a natural hair care products and more type of store, uh, conveniently located inside Cali Beauty. So hit them up. Also, Stephanie Renee, if you're listening, which you should be, because I shout you out on most of my shows. Please make sure to share this podcast and uh, our channel with your friends, family, and other associates. So, today's show, you know I have to do it. I want to talk about the heralds of gentrification. And really, I, I, should, I shouldn't use the word gentrification because that's just Whitey's little nice way of saying something else, which is ethnic cleansing. So I want to talk about the heralds of ethnic cleansing. In case you're not aware, in case you're not in America or wherever you may be, um, <clears throat> there are heralds of gentrification or ethnic cleansing. Um, and if you're not certain a herald is a sign that something is coming so what's the sign that gentrification or ethnic cleansing is coming well there's several 
But the ones I want to focus on are your Whole Foods, your Trader Joe's, and your Starbucks. Those are heralds of your area being gentrified. Once you see that shit appear, it's a wrap. Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Starbucks, it's a wrap. Your area, is your community, it's gone. You will be moved. You understand? And I want to talk about the obvious one, which is Starbucks. Starbucks is the obvious sign of uh, gentrification uh, or ethnic cleansing coming to your neighborhood. And Starbucks was in the the news recently, um, playing a part that's really common in the 10 or so steps of ethnic cleansing. Uh, If you aren't aware, Starbucks uh, this past week, uh, two black men entered a Starbucks, and within two minutes of their entering, the police were called. They They were there to have a business meeting with some white guy, which raises an eyebrow for me, by the way, when I see black folks, two black men at that, sitting up doing business with these guys, but okay. So two black men had been in Starbucks for two minutes, uh, before the police were called, um, for, and they were there for a meeting with a, a white business par- partner. They were arrested. Um, Starbucks, in a statement, acknowledged the call to the cops as being excessive. I understand that the store manager was fired, which likely means that she was just transferred somewhere up the block. But what you see in the Starbucks story, and what I'm going to get at or get into in this in today's show, is that there is ethnic cleansing happening in black communities. In fact, there's ethnic cleansing happening towards black people. Uh, Before I get into the the telltale signs of uh, ethnic cleansing, let me play this interview that the two black men in question in the Starbucks fiasco, they were on Good Morning America. And I'm going to play the interview that one Robin Roberts gave these two black men. And their their white lawyer was nearby as well. And I want you to take a listen. I want you to listen closely to what Robin is asking them. And listen closely to the answers that they are giving. And when, if you do that, you will see the problem that a lot of black people have in society. Okay? So let me play this clip. Uh, I'm playing this clip as a, uh, to be used in uh, commentary, fair use. So uh, here we go. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. <sighs> it has been quite a week. It has been quite a week. Um, Dante, you both walk in. You get a table. Rashawn, how long was it before you asked to use the restroom? Uh, immediately, as soon as I walked in. And uh, she stated that they were for paying customers only, and I just left it at that, at that moment. And the response was, you have to buy something? Yes. Then you go and find Dante. You're at the table. What happened next? Um, we're at the table. We sit down. We're just talking amongst each other. Um, she then comes from around the register, asks, you know, walks up to us, asks if, uh, you know, she can help us with anything. Can we start with some drinks or water or something like that? You know, for when we have bottles of water with us, so, you know, we're fine. We're just waiting for a meeting. We'll be out really quick type thing. Um, and that was it. So approximately 4.35, you arrive for a 4.45 business meeting. According to 911 accounts, a call was placed at 4.37, approximately two minutes after you arrived, to 911. What did you think when you saw police arrive, Dante? You can't be here for us. So when they do approach you, what do they say and how do you react? Well, initially, as um, soon as they approach us, they just said we have to leave. There was no question of, you know, was there a problem here between you guys and the manager? You know, what happened? When you were arrested, did they tell you what you were being arrested for? No, not at the time. We wasn't read any rights. Nothing. Just double lock, handcuffs behind our back, and escorted out and put into a squat car. 
Why do you both think that store manager called 911? Well, you, Robin, you're asking them to um, have an opinion about somebody else's intent. The facts speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. There's not a single witness that says that these young men were misbehaving in any way, and you can see and hear that on the video. Well, the video has been viewed almost 11 million times, and, and part of it, Dante, you can see that you're talking to the police officer. What were you all saying to one another? I was just trying to, you know, process the situation to myself at the time, um, because I'm thinking about my family that I have, my community. So in that moment, I'm trying to process what's going on because it didn't really hit me what was going on and it was real until I'm being double locked and my hands behind my back. Dante, did you at, at some point uh, offer to uh, call the person you were supposed to meet with? Because I, I know he, I, he's I shown on the videotape. Uh, After the first time, you know, they walk over and they say, you have to leave. I say, we're here for a meeting. What is the business meeting about? It's a real estate meeting. Okay. We've been working on this for months. What, what do you say to some people who say rules are rules, that Starbucks has a policy, you viol violated that policy, the police asked you repeatedly to leave, and you didn't? How do you respond to people who say that? What I say is I understand that. Rules are rules, but what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And that's in any situation, whether it's race involved or anything. And, and Robin, I'm sorry, but what is, what is that rule? Starbucks holds itself uh, open as a, uh, a place uh, for people to meet uh, and to have public conversations. Those are words from their website. The CEO, Kevin Johnson, said he has met with you. Can you divulge what you all discussed? We approached uh, Starbucks and suggested that we engage in, medi in, in mediation with a retired federal judge in Philadelphia and they agreed to that proposal and we are still involved in that process. That process requires confidentiality. What do you want to see happen here, Dante? I want to make sure that in this, situa this situation doesn't happen again. So what I want is for a young man or young men to not be traumatized by this and instead motivated, inspired. And what do you want, Rashawn? So, you know, you know, take this opportunity as as a stepping stone, you know, to really stand up and, you know, show your greatness and that you you are not judged by the color of your skin as our ancestors were or anyone else. You know, this is something that has been going on for years and everyone's blind to it, but they know what's going on, if you get what I mean. And um you know, just really taking those actions and putting them into place and, you know, help people understand that it's not just a black people thing. This is a people thing. And that's exactly what we want to see out of this. And that's ch true change. So put action into place and stop using your words. We appreciate you using your words here with us this morning and this discussion. And it has to be more than dialogue, as you said. It has to be action. And we appreciate your willingness to be a part of that, and Mr. Cohen, as Thank well. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. And we know Starbucks has announced already that they plan to close 8,000 locations for an afternoon of racial bias training. Uh, Who I hasn't assume. spent two minutes waiting yeah. in a Starbucks? Two minutes. And I think when people hear that and the fact that he called the, the business person that they were going to meet, they were going to meet at 445. They got there 10 minutes early. Yes, he asked to use the restroom. He claims that he was never told that you, uh, that you had to leave. He just said that, that he was just said that he was told you have to purchase something. But that being, that being said, um, this, is, this is a moment um, where there has to be change. Have they yeah. decided what kind of action they're going to take? Um, I did ask their lawyer, uh, Stuart Cohen, if they had planned on, on um, a civil suit of some sort against either Starbucks or the city. They said that's not what they're thinking about at this time, that they want to be a part of the process. Remember Kevin Johnson, the CEO, mm -hmm. said that they wanted those gentlemen to be part of the process. Uh, they say they're still working that out, and they were going to allow us, GMA, to follow along and follow up with them and see how that process plays out. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully, you know, 
Michael. Come mm-hmm. on. Uh, two minutes. I mean, and as you said, he said in the piece, actions, not just words. And I think that's what they're looking for to see it really yeah. a real change. Not just with Starbucks, but I think with it's with a societal issue. Society, this is a, this yeah. can't, you just can't label it on Starbucks. Yeah. No. And we'll stick with it all the way. We will. It's a societal issue. You can't just label it on Starbucks. That sounds like um, we don't want to lose sponsorship here. We don't want to lose potential endorsements. That's more of that Negro electric slide shit that you, that you guys do around the issues of race and being dominated. A, a couple things I noticed in that interview that I found interesting. Why does Robin Roberts sound like Obama? Particularly at the end when she starts talking about change. She sounds just like Obama. You know, what's... Uh, anyway. Also, why did Robin have to ask these two brothers what was the meeting about? That's not really the point, is it? Isn't the point at all what the meeting was about? Why didn't she ask who was the meeting with? You see the the game here. It's a it's a way of trying to kind of put a knock on the fellas. Like, well, what are you guys discussing business about? And then the two guys. I mean, I could probably do a whole show on the way they responded to a lot of those questions. And the little afterpiece where they, where Robin is talking to um, Mike Strahan and them um, about the fact that these guys just want to be a part of the process. A part of what process? What are you talking about? When they grabbed that Asian doctor up off that United Airlines flight, did you hear him talking about being a part of the process of change and all that shit? Nah, you heard he got money. You feel him, my dog? He got paid off. And black folks, you're going to have to stop with this kumbaya bullshit. When we go, when they go low, we go high and all that. You got to stop it now. You're actively participating in your own execution. It's as though you're sharpening the guillotine. Once you sharpen the guillotine, you think the executioner cares about your life again? I mean, come on now. When white folks have some atrocity done against them, they bomb countries the next day. When they, when, when a, a, a some Arab or something bombs a race? One of these marathons? You don't hear white folks asking for forgiveness the next day? You don't hear the, the media asking uh, some of the victims' families or what have you, or the victims themselves if, 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 if they have lived through the ordeal. You don't hear them asking them, can you find forgiveness in your heart? They always come to you, black man, black woman, with this bullshit. You are participating. You are clearing the path towards your own destruction. Because once these savages start to understand that they could kill you with impunity and all you have for them is your fucking forgiveness, your religion, your religious bullshit, frankly, They will keep doing this to you. But I've talked about this kind of stuff in in several podcasts in the past. Today's podcast is about the heralds of ethnic cleansing, also known as gentrification. The heralds of ethnic cleansing. As I mentioned, some of the heralds are Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, and the very same Starbucks who's embroiled in this so-called scandal in the last few days.
So we're talking about ethnic cleansing. What is ethnic cleansing? Ethnic cleansing is the attempt to get rid of members of an unwanted ethnic group, racial group, in order to establish an ethnically homogenous geographic area. Let me read that again. Ethnic cleansing is the attempt to get rid of members of an unwanted ethnic or racial group in order to establish an ethnically or racially homogenous geographic area. Isn't that the goal of gentrification? Isn't that what we've been seeing is the end result of gentrification? Aren't we seeing that in parts of Detroit? New York City, and other places across the United States? Aren't we starting to see that in the Caribbean? Aren't, haven't we seen that in apartheid in, in, in Africa, in South Africa, and other countries in Africa? So they give it a cool little lordly type of name, gentrification, but really... When this type of shit happens with white folks, with white-on-white -white crime in Europe, with different uh, ethnic groups, or different religious groups, they call it what it is. It's ethnic cleansing. This is what we are seeing in this so-called gentrification in the U.S. of ethnic racial cleansing. Ethnic cleansing can involve the deportation, the displacement, or even the mass killing of a group of people. Common examples is the so-called Holocaust of the European Jews, Rwanda in the 1990s, the Turkish, um, the Turkish massacre of Armenians in, I think that was World War I, even the Native Americans by European settlers in North America. All of that shit is ethnic cleansing. And, and right now, currently, the removal of black folks from their communities, being pushed out, being displaced, being killed in their communities, all a part of ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing always involves some type of nationalism and racist theory. There's always an us versus a them, and I'll get into that in a second. But in that us and them paradigm, there's a nationalism. There's the nationalism of the us. And there's the, racial the, the racist theories against the them. If you go back in your history books, you'll see that Hitler began his cleansing with deportation. And it ended in what's called the final solution. You know what the final solution was? Concentration camps and mass killings. Mass killing centers, ovens and all this type of shit for people to walk into. The other thing that's associated as you can tell from my last point with ethnic cleansing, is genocide. Now, some people put them at odds somewhat. They'll say ethnic cleansing versus genocide. I say ethnic cleansing is genocide. Genocide is the intent on physical destruction of certain, um, you know, of, of entire, certain and entire religious and racial groups. The distinction some people make is that ethnic cleansing is just to achieve hom homogenous uh, communities. And it doesn't necessarily involve killing. But what we're seeing as a black community in America is that there is killing. It just hasn't reached mass killings in isolated communities. But there is mass killings uh, nationally across the country. How many black unarmed people have been murdered in, in the last few years? That's mass killing. It's just spread out across the country, and it's not specific to particular areas, at least so they say. But when you um, talk about 
genocide. Um, there was a site called Genocide Watchers, I think it was, that talks about the ten stages of genocide. The first stage of genocide is classification. It's determining the us versus the them. Again, the ten stages of genocide. Number one, classification, determining the us versus the them. Number two is symbolization. Names, symbols, etc. are given to classification, the us versus them. So names and symbols are given to the them, often in coded language, like, for example, crack victims, drug dealers, welfare queens, magical Negroes, angry black women. You see what I'm saying? Haven't you heard these terms before to kind of sweep all of us under one rug? These are the names and the symbols that they give us as classification. And it's coded language for us, for us black folks. Some people would even throw in Muslim. It's coded language for black folks. Muslim extremists and all that stuff, coded language. So again, in your 10 steps of, of genocide, you have the classification, the us versus them. You have the symbolization where they give... Uh, they give names and symbols to the us as a classification. And often those names and symbols are in coded language. The third stage of genocide is discrimination. Dominant group uses law, custom, political power to deny the rights of other groups. Doesn't that sound familiar to you? Number four is dehumanization. One group denies the humanity of the other group. One group denies the humanity of the other group. They can call them animals, vermin, insects, uh, disease. And that's stuff that you hear the cops do to us. And I'll talk about that more a little bit later. When you have the dehumanization of a group, of a classified, of a uh, symbolized of a discriminated group, once you dehumanize them, that leads to the murder of them. Because what happens is, when people don't value your humanity, that helps those people overcome the normal, what's the word, revulsion against murder. Think about it. If a cockroach was one day considered human, it'd be harder for you to mash it with your shoe. Or if a little baby was being, desi was being designated a human, uh, sorry, if a little baby was being designated a cockroach, you couldn't mash it with your shoe because you will see the humanity. You see, you see what I'm saying? Once you've been dehumanized, it's easy for the power groups to, or for the power, for the dominant entity to destroy the submissive entity. Okay. So, like I said, we're talking about the ten stages of genocide. Um, I saw this; these ten steps on this site. I think it's called the Genocide Watcher. Um, again, the first step is classification. That's where they determine the us versus the them. Second is the symbolization, where they give names and symbols to the classification, to the them. That's when the us gives names and symbol classifications to the them. Oftentimes, it's in coded language. And like I cited, you know, from the newspapers, you could have welfare queens, crack babies, crack victims, drug dealers, uh, what's the other one, magical Negro, angry black woman, etc. Right? Those are, that's the symbolization. Third, you have the discrimination where the dominant group uses laws, customs, uh, policies, political power to deny the rights of other groups. 
Number four was the dehumanization, where one group um, denies the humanity of the other group. Uh, they use, again, again, they could use coded language, that symbolization called groups animals and vermin, insects of disease, uh, you know, that kind of thing that cops tend to do. And when you dehumanize the group, it leads to murder because once you dehumanize them, once you make them subhuman, less than, it's easier to take out something that is subhuman or less than you as a human being. It's, easier, it's, it's pretty easy to kill a goat. You see what I'm saying? Or it's easy to kill a fly or a mosquito or a cockroach. Because you don't have, because as humans we value ourselves on top of the animal kingdom. We proclaim dominion over those things. So when this, when this genocidal savage has dehumanized you, it's like nothing for them to want to kill you. And that's what we see. Fifth step is organization. Fifth step of genocide is organization. Genocide is always organized. It's not haphazard. It's usually carried out by the state militia. Oftentimes it's decentralized, so you, meaning that um, you know it's informal. It's decentralized, meaning that you have terrorist groups that can arise that help in bringing about the the destruction, the genocide of a group. So when you say genocide is organized and usually carried out by the state militia, you're talking about your police, your army. Your military, right? When you say say that it's sometimes informal or it's, or it's, or it's decentralized, you're talking about terrorist vigilante groups. That's your KKK, etc. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. Number six, you have polarization, right? So it's not only us versus them that you saw in. The first step, or the first stage, was, which was classification. But now it's the extreme us versus them. That's, that's what polarization is. So you got an extremism that really drives the groups apart. Okay? The seventh stage is preparation. In preparation, what you have to do is indoctrinate the population with fear. Hitler did it. Many others have done it. You have to indoctrinate the people with fear. When The, the way they were able to suppress a lot of slave uprisings was through fear. They let Whitey know if these Negroes get free and get access to these guns and stuff, that could be a wrap. So you, in, and, you know, they were right, actually. So you indoctrinate the people with fear. You use slogans. You say things like, um, you know, they will, they will kill you, and impregnate your daughters, that kind of shit. They, they will say stuff like, well, if we don't kill them first, they'll kill us. And all that is a part of preparation. Once you get those people afraid, they organize. They fall in line. They view the other, the them, as his enemy. And this is why I've said in previous shows, and I'll say it again, all white folks are racist. All of them. All of them play a role in white organization. Active roles in planning and policy and, and, and passive roles in denial. And we're going to talk about denial later on. But that's how they prepare. They indoctrinate their people with fear. Number eight of the ten stages of, of genocide is persecution. 
Victims are identified and separated based on their identity. So when people tell you this shit is about classism, bullshit. Because you can't necessarily identify a class. If it was about identifying a class, half of these unarmed black folks wouldn't be killed because, you know, black folks, we, we try to shine like the best of them. They would look at them and say, oh, no, they're flossing too hard. No, 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 they're upper class. If it was about classism. So again, the eighth stage of genocide is persecution. Victims are identified and separated based on identity. You use that identity, and you can segregate them, these uh, folks, into ghettos. You could deport them into concentration camps. You could confine them to famine-struck regions, and you can starve them out. That's persecution. So again, we're talking about the ten stages of genocide. And like I said earlier in the broadcast, so-called gentrification is actually ethnic cleansing. And ethnic cleansing is actually genocide. And there's some who will who will make distinctions between those two things, ethnic cleansing and genocide. But the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, they both aim at creating these homogeneous societies, these all-white societies, okay? That's, what's, that's all it's about. So they are essentially the same. In the 10 stages of genocide, that I'm going off following the Genocide Watcher website. Number one is classification. That's the first stage. That's where you, that's where you identify the us versus them. Number two is symbolization. That's where you attach names and symbols to, to the them in the first stage classification. Often these names and symbols are coded, for example, crack uh, babies, crack victims, drug dealers, welfare queens, magical Negroes, angry black women, you know, that shit that we hear all the time. Thugs, that type of shit, right? And some would say Muslim is coded language for, black, for all black people. I've heard that said several, several times before. In the third stage, there's discrimination, where the dominant group uses laws, customs, policies, po- political power to deny the rights of other groups. In the fourth stage, you have dehumanization. One group deems the humanity of the other group to be nothing or to be very little, or, to, or they just basically deny the other group's humanity. And again, that's where you have some symbolization coming in, where they use coded words like animals, vermin, thugs, insects of disease, you know, shit cops say, shit white people say. And this dehumanization can lead to murder because once you've overcome the human's normal revulsion to murder, which is by dehumanizing people, you you don't see them as people, so it's easier to murder them, That's what happens in the fourth stage of genocide, the dehumanization. In the fifth stage, you see organization. Genocide is usually organized. It's not something haphazard. It's not slapped together. It's not just done on a whim. It's organized. And it's usually backed or organized by the state militias. Your, your 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 military, your police force. Sometimes this organization can be informal. 
or like I like to say, decentralized. So it's not attached to the state, but there's a lot of essentially terrorist groups, vigilantes like the KKK and stuff like that, who join in the genocide over people. And this is just the fifth step. And I've already since gone through to the eight steps. And you should see already these things are happening to us. Number, the sixth stage is polariza polar polarization. The sixth stage is polarization. That's where you have the extreme us versus them. So there's extremism that comes into play. Right? And that further drives the group, the two groups, the us versus them apart. So it's the extreme us versus them. The seventh stage is preparation. That's the indoctrination stage. That's where you indoctrinate the population with fear. You tell them things like they're going to come in and they're going to take our women. They're going to impregnate our, our daughters. If we don't kill them first, they will kill us. That's how they prepare through that indoctrination with fear. The eighth stage is persecution. Your victims are identified and separated based on identity. Key word there is identity. Don't tell me about this shit is about class. This shit is very much about identity. Victims are identified and, separ and, and, and separated based on, in our case especially, racial identity. Once you're separated based on identity, that's when they segregate you into ghettos. They deport you into concentration camp, camps, think prisons. They confine you to famine-stricken famine, famine -stricken regions, and they starve you out. That's when you hear people in the health science field talking about food deserts. That's what they're talking about. If you're in an impoverished black community right now, which most of us are, Think about what food you have around you. And then think about white neighborhoods and think about the food that they have around them. But that's what they do when they gentrify you. They herd you into what I call just mass concentration camps. Our, our neighborhoods are concentration camps. We're famine-stricken in our neighborhoods because our neighborhoods don't have shit to eat. And what there is to eat ain't good for you. So in the ninth stage of genocide, there's extermination. That's where you have your mass killings. And the exterminations occur because they don't see you as fully human. The militaries, the militias, like the cops, the KKK, they will do the killing. And it's state-sanctioned. This is why you don't see cops. Anyway, I'm going to get into that later, but this is why you don't see cops getting prosecuted, getting charged, getting jailed, really. The state gave them that sanction to go and do that shit. The interesting thing about the ninth stage, the extermination stage of genocide, is that not only do you have the mass killings and these exterminations being carried out, you know, state sanctioned and carried out by the militias and um, the military and certain terrorist groups and stuff like that, but... This stage also acknowledges that the, the group being persecuted does sometimes act in revenge. So you, you can have revenge killings in stage 9 of genocide. And I'm going to expand on that a little bit later. So I'm about to hit stage number 10. Let me just quickly go through 
uh, stages one through nine before I get to stage 10. And again, by this time, you guys should be able to see everything I'm say saying when I'm talking about the 10 stages of genocide applies to us. And if it applies to us in terms of genocide, and I, as I established, ethnic cleansing, so-called gentrification, equals genocide, then you're in right now, you're in the midst of an extermination, a genocide program. The 10 stages of genocide, quickly, I'll go through 1 through 9 before I touch number 10. You have number 1, classification, that's us versus them, that's the determination of us versus them, or them versus us. Stage 2, you have the symbolization, that's where names and symbols are given to the classification of, of them versus us, right? Often it's in coded language, like I mentioned, crack whores, crack victims, crack babies, drug dealers, welfare queens, magical Negroes, angry black women, thugs, thank you President Obama, thugs, those are symbolizations, those are names and symbols given to the them when the us is planning on exterminating them. Third stage is discrimination. Uh, that's where the dominant group uses laws, customs, policies, you know, political power to deny the rights of other groups. Four is dehumanization, where one group um, deny, denies the humanity of the other group. And again, that's where some of that symbolization comes in, where you have the name calling. They call them animals, vermin, insects. You know, that kind of shit that cops tend to do, and white folks in general. And dehumanization leads to murder. Because if I don't see the humanity in you, it's easier for me to, to murder you. The fifth stage of genocide is organization. Genocide is organized, usually by the state, um, you know, state-sanctioned um, militias, like the police, like the, the military, um, sometimes this organization is informal, or as I call it, decentralized. It's not, it's not necessarily state-sanctioned, but it's state-approved. That's where you have your terrorist groups like the KKK, the alt-right, etc. Okay? Um, some, of these, some of these white boys who walk in churches and kill a bunch of people, sending bombs to people's houses... These guys are decentralized organizations, okay? The sixth stage is polarization. That's where you have the, extre the extremism comes into play, and that further drives the groups apart. So you have those extremists, in the case of gentrification, ethnic cleansing, genocide, you have the extremists, these white folks who get extreme, and that really drives... Whites and blacks apart. Not that I mind too much that we are apart. The seventh stage is preparation. Preparation is the indoctrination of the population with fear. You prepare the population with fear. You tell them things like, they're going to come in and steal your women. They're going to impregnate your daughters. If we don't kill them first, they're going to kill you. That's the preparation stage, the seventh stage of genocide. The eighth stage of genocide is persecution. Victims are identified and separated based on an identity. And this is where the whole classism, classism argument doesn't work for me because people don't really see your class. People see your race, though. Once they identify the victims by race, they can segregate the victims into ghettos. They can deport them into uh, concentration camps. They can confine them to famine-stricken regions and starve them out. You know, this is the food deserts that uh, healthcare specialists have been talking about for some years now, that the black community in particular has uh, huge gaps in, in uh, or huge food deserts, I should say, where you ain't eating shit proper, 
when you do eat, etc., that's all a part of your persecution. Number nine is extermination, plain and simple. Mass killings, um, and the reason why they can exterminate you, like I said before, is because they don't see you as fully human. And when done in conjunction with the state through militias and militaries and stuff who do the killing, you can have revenge killings in return. That was the ninth stage, extermination of genocide. The tenth and final stage of genocide, before we go to a commercial break, is denial. Denial. I'm not, not talking about the river in Egypt. Throughout all of genocide, there's denial. Once you have that denial throughout all the stages of genocide, that ensures more genocide will occur. You understand? Once these white boys, once these savages practice that denial throughout all these stages of, of genocide, that ensures more genocidal massacres will occur. What they do is they, dec they deny that crimes were committed. They blame the victim. You know, um, they block investigations of, of criminal activity. That's all the stuff you see happening with the police. That's all the stuff you see happening with, with victims. They'll look up your report card and talk about you got an F in social studies and say that was why he got fucked up out there. When they can't find something on you, they'll talk about your dad was in jail. Your uncle hung out with, with uh, Malcolm X. They'll bring all sorts of shit. They, they are such reachers, but that's a part of the denial. And denial is a huge component of genocide. It's the huge component of so-called gentrification, which is just essentially ethnic cleansing and genocide. Okay? Now, on the other side of this break, I'm going to break down what can be, I guess, can be seen as a case study where I, I'm going to apply these 10 stages to an event we should all be familiar with. In fact, it's the event um, in particular that got me to decide to podcast. Um, there had been Trayvon Martin before. There had been a few others. But um, this one case I want to talk about on the other side is what got me into podcasting. And to me, it's a perfect example of the 10 stages of genocide. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back on the other side of the break. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. When will African people have basic rights? When will we be protected? When will our cost of living be eliminated? When will our cultures be preserved? We need a new leadership. One that has studied the problems and learned the solutions. The Pro-Black Compendium is the book to start off that leadership. Quotations, essays, poems, stories, codes of conduct, curricula, principles, relationship advice, marketing tips, group economics, games, book clubs, movie nights, chronologies, civilizations, wars, warriors, authors, songs, conflict resolution, the list goes on. There is no book more necessary for starting our people on the path to African redemption. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. 
Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. Um, I'm right now in the midst of breaking down um, the 10 steps of, of genocide or the 10 stages of genocide, but this conversation is a part of a larger conversation at the start of the show. I was talking about um, the heralds of genocide. And I played an, an, an interview from Good Morning America with two black men who were recently arrested within two minutes of entering a Starbucks for a business meeting with a third party who was running late. And as I started to show off by saying, Starbucks, um, places like Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, stuff like that, and in your state, whatever state you're in, listen to this, or whatever country you're in, I want you below in the uh, in the description box area on YouTube, I want you to let us know what are some of the stores that come into black neighborhoods that herald the, the beginning of um, ethnic cleansing of black communities. Like I said, in, in the east, in the, in the northeast of, uh, of America, it's typically Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, and uh, Starbucks. They are the heralds of ethnic cleansing, genocide, or what white folks like to call gentrification. And I took time to go through the ten, te- the ten stages of genocide. And just before the break, I mentioned I wanted to, you know, talk about um, basically a, a kind of a case study um, that kind of shows you how these ten stages are legit. And the case study is Ferguson in the wake of um, the Mike Brown um, murder by, by that white supremacist cop, Darren Wilson. Um, you know, the, the, the killing of Mike Brown is what really led me to want to begin the Bitter Medicine podcast. I found myself, like many of you who are listening, um, talking about all these different things that were happening. You know, there was Trayvon Martin. At some point, there was Sandra Bland. There was Mike Brown. The, you know, we've we've had Eric Garner. We've had Alton Sterling. We've had um, the former Jets player, whose name I can't remember right now, who was shot by a white motorist in, I think it was New Orleans, uh, maybe last year or, or late 20, 2016. I can't remember. But that's where this show was born out of. It was born out of that frustration and the realization that I spent time posting about it and statuses on Facebook and whatnot, maybe I should put together a better platform, which was a podcast, to talk about these things. And when I created this podcast, I envisioned being able to talk to the listeners more often. And that's something I still have in my mind to do. I, I am really considering doing a monthly Ask me anything type podcast about topics that are, are current that are related to the black struggle, um, and not just to talk about the, the problems, but actually to brainstorm some solutions. So I want to keep that in mind, and I want you guys to keep that in mind. But the problem I'm having is I don't want to go through the challenges of setting that up, and no one calls. You know, right now, I only get a few, I only have a few subscribers on YouTube, so if you're listening to this for the first time, and even if you're not listening on YouTube, can you go to YouTube, find the Bitter Medicine Podcast channel, and subscribe? It, it's, I, I still don't have 100 subscribers, I think, and that's a shame. Uh, it makes it difficult sometimes to put these shows on, because you start to question, are people even listening, really? But... I know now that some people are listening. In fact, uh, Darius Webb hit me up on Facebook. Shout out to Darius Webb. He's an avid listener of the show. And he inquired with me recently about um, doing like call-in shows, shows where 
I have conversations with the listeners, and it's through him, really, that I'm contemplating it again, seriously, seriously contemplating it again, but I need more subscribers. I don't want to go live and do live shows and no one shows up, you know? And I, I recently started this Ask Me Anything post on Facebook. Um, if you're not following us on Facebook, look up the Bitter Medicine Podcast on Facebook and, and like our page and follow our content. Um, but Darius asked the question, do you think it's possible to be revolutionary in thought or action while also adhering to traditional religions forced upon our ancestors by their oppressors? I'm going to read that one more time. Do you think it's possible to be revolutionary in thought or action while also adhering to traditional religions forced upon our ancestors by their oppressors? Now, my answer to that, I'm going to make this a quick answer before I get to the case study, but my answer to that is that, number one, it was forced on your ancestors. Anything that was forced on your people, you shouldn't adhere to. And once you adhere to that thing that was forced onto your people, I particularly find you questionable. Okay? If you adhere to anything, especially anything that's poisonous to your people and their existence, I look at you questionably. However, we've had people who stood up for the community who were religious and stuck to traditional religious practice, even though they were speaking up on black suffering. And there's two people who should come to mind, and it should be obvious to you who those two people are. One was... uh, Muslim, Nation of Islam, one was Christian. And in recent years, through much discourse, much dialogue with other learned people, particularly guys like um, Onita Say from um, the Pro Black Perspective podcast on KWAZ Radio, you know, I, I realized that these guys were agents of confusion. Now, I think within themselves, they probably meant well, but their religion made them confused, and it confused a lot of people who followed them. And I'm talking about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. The hard thing about ever critiquing those two gentlemen is the fact that they lost their life pursuing the struggle and the way They wanted to pursue the struggle. And so for that reason, I I won't shit on them completely, but I will from now on go forward and say, hey, take those guys with a little grain of of salt because they practiced traditional, traditional religion that was forced upon their ancestors, particularly MLK. Christianity was forced on black folks. So I do want to say that if you're a traditional religion person and you're adherent to traditional religion, uh, I'm not going to take your message wholesale. I'm going to have to look at it and break it down. I'm going to have to critique it. You know, even Marcus Gavi was a Roman Catholic. So I'm going to have to look at it and critique it. Um, do you throw the whole human being out because they're religious? Not necessarily. But you definitely take them with a grain of salt. And today we're talking about ethnic cleansing by way, ethnic cleansing and genocide by way of so-called gentrification, white people's gentrification in black neighborhoods. And a lot of the people who would try to tell you that it's not ethnic cleansing, it's not genocide, are your religious folks. 
your religious folks want to tell black folks, ah, you know, extend your hand in love and all that old bullshit. You see what I'm saying? And I can't be down with that. Okay? So, let me get into the case study of Ferguson in the wake of Mike Brown being killed. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to juxtapose it to the 10 stages of genocide. Okay? So let's go. Number one, when you look at Ferguson and you look at the stages of genocide, number one stage of genocide is classification. That's the us versus them. Uh, Ferguson is the 19th most segregated city in the U.S. The 19th most segregated city in the U.S. And by the way, there's about 3,100 cities in the United States. It's the 19th most segregated city. Um, Ferguson is the 16th fastest gentrifying city in the U.S. And I just told you how many cities there are. It's the 16th most gentrifying city. Previously, um, Ferguson was really a white town, to be honest. By 2008, the population of the poor people, mostly black, doubled. So in 1990, Ferguson was 73.8% white versus 25.1% black. In 2010... Ferguson is 29.3% white, 67.4% black. And so now, white folks want to take back what they feel was theirs. So then they create, so then they have the classification, that's the us versus them. It's 67.4% black, that's the them. 29.3% white, that's us according to white people. So then they attach their symbolism. That's the second stage of genocide. So when you attach symbolism to your look at Ferguson, you got to go back in the news, and you, if you remember, Mike Huckabee, who was a former presidential candidate and a senator and stuff, he, he said that, um, that Brown acted like a thug. Remember when I talked about symbolism, I talk about the, the names and symbols that they apply to the them and the us versus them paradigm. And I talked about sometimes crack babies, crack whores, crack victims, drug dealers, welfare queens, magical Negroes, angry black women, and thugs. So Mike Huckabee came and put the symbolism on, on Mike Brown. And, and by the way, the same thing was placed on the people rioting about this this murder of Mike Brown by Darren Wilson, they were called thugs as well. So this is the, th- the, the symbolism that you start seeing, that, that's step two or stage two of, of genocide, and you can see that in Ferguson. Stage three is discrimination. There was a 105-page report uh, written on discriminatory, discriminatory intent among city officials in Ferguson in terms of policy, policing, etc. They reached a whole 105 pages to tell you that there were discriminatory intent amongst the city officials, policymakers, police, etc. Okay? Number four, or the fourth stage of genocide as it relates to Ferguson, looking at it as a case study, um, if you remember the fourth stage is dehumanization. Darren Wilson, the cop who killed Mike Brown. Now, Darren Wilson claims that he was driving by Mike Brown and his friend. I forgot the friend's name now. They were walking in the middle of the street for some reason. You know, like Negroes do. Right? Don't, Don't we all walk in the middle of the street for no reason? So these Negroes were walking in the middle of the street Darren Wilson claims to have calmly told them, hey, why don't you guys walk on the side of the road? At which point, Mike Brown just decides to stick his head through the the cop car window and punch Darren Wilson twice and reach for Darren Wilson's gun because Darren Wilson politely asked him and his friend to walk on the sidewalk. So we know that's bullshit, right? But 
Don Wilson claims um, afterwards that Mike Brown looked like a demon. You follow that? Don Wilson said he looked at Mike Brown and looked in his eyes and he saw a demon. So right there, Don Wilson dehumanized Mike Brown. Because if I know, if I get up from here and I see a duppy or a demon, I'm going to try to kill that. Right? Wouldn't you? A duppy or a demon is not, or a ghost or whatever the hell you want to call it, is not human to me. In the riots after the, the, the murder of Brown, um, police responded with tear gas, armed vehicles, and other military equipment usually seen in war. Why did they do that? This was a community reaction to an unjust murder. They were rioting in response to it, and the response by the state, by the government, was to send out troops or police with tear gas, armed vehicles, and other military equipment that you usually only see in war. They did that because the community was seen as a place to be contained and controlled. Not unlike, say, animals in a jungle. So their humanity was denied even in that instance. Mike Brown's humanity was denied when Darren Wilson claims he looked at him and he saw a demon, or he saw the eyes of a demon, or some shit he said like that. So dehumanization is the fourth stage of genocide, and that's what we see in Ferguson, the case study of Ferguson. Number five, the fifth stage of genocide is organization. The police were militarized. Given these weapons and vehicles, you only see really in wartime. The police were militarized. They were organized as a military. Remember when I talked about organization, I also said to you that in organization, sometimes it's informal, or as I said, decentralized, where you have terrorist groups and militias and stuff coming, coming to be, coming to persecute the people who, who are having genocide and enacted upon them. In Ferguson, you had a white group called the Oath Keepers, a white militia carrying guns. And the police did nothing about it. In fact, um, what was her name? Kayla, Kayla Reed, a civil rights activist who was working with Black Lives Matter, who was out there in Ferguson, asked the question on the news, in the media, mainstream media, she asked, why are there men with guns and the police are doing nothing? Why are these oath keepers out here with guns and the police are doing nothing? Well, it's called organizing, you dummy. That's what it's called. The militias recognize the state-sanctioned militia the terror, the, the, the state sanctioned militias recognize the terrorists because that's a part of being organized. So asking why is like a dumb question. The Oath Keepers were claiming that they were out there to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's from the Constitution to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, even if it means defying other laws and orders. Even if it means defying other laws and orders. So these assholes, white men, white militia with guns, were out there in Ferguson looking to kill rioters over the 
the killing of an unarmed black man out there in Ferguson. This is right out. This, all of this stuff is textbook stages of genocide. And the Oath Keepers are essentially a decentralized terrorist group. They're right up there with the alt-right, the KKK. And I want to talk about the KKK in a second. The sixth stage of genocide is polarization. Remember I said polarization is, ex is extremism. And it's extremism that drives the, the two groups even further apart. And particularly the extremism comes from the already dominating group. Because the extremism from the, from the victim is just trying to protect itself. It's not on the offensive. It's actually playing defense most times. So that extremism could be seen when you, when you apply this to Ferguson and the Mike Brown situation. That's the Oath Keepers. The Oath Keepers are extremists. Do you know the Missouri KKK leader boasted that Ferguson protests boosted recruitment? Just the fact that black folks were out there in mass protesting the unjust murder of a black teen by some racist cop, that got, that got white folks looking to enlist in the KKK even more. They actually saw a boost in recruitment. They also passed out flyers for KKK Neighborhood Watch, and, and the KKK actually had a fundraiser for Darren Wilson in that time. A lot of people forget that. Now, before I get to stage seven as it applies, stage seven of genocide as it applies to um, Ferguson, can't you see these things happening around you? Right now, it's happening across the whole nation of America. I'm sure it's happening across states or countries in Africa. It's happening in the Caribbean. How much more, how many more stages do we need to, to go through before you see the problem? When you see what, what happened recently with Starbucks here, and remember, Starbucks is a herald of ethnic cleansing of black communities. When you see that, don't take it lightly, is what I'm really getting at here. Don't take it as, oh, that's just another case of racism going on. No, it's, it's an important part of the stages of genocide. And genocide means mass extermination, ultimately. Let's not stand around and look at this type of stuff happening with Starbucks and stuff and take it lightly when that ultimately means, the presence of these places ultimately means that you, your children, your grand, some offspring of you is going to be exterminated if you don't stand up today and recognize the problem and what the problem ultimately means and come up with a solution today for the problem that's today. We got to stop kicking the ball down the road for our children to pick up and start kicking next. Or for our grandchildren to, 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 to kick it next. We got to stop being on some kumbaya bullshit. We got to stop saying things like, it'll work out, man. God is in God's hands now. I mean, come on. If racism, ethnic cleansing, genocide, gentrification, whatever you want to call it, if, that was le if white folks had left that shit in God's hands, there would be none of it going on. 
They are actively doing this on their own accord. And you need to actively do something to thwart it. So the seventh stage of genocide as it relates to Ferguson, the seventh stage of genocide is preparation. The KKK in Ferguson released flyers promising to use lethal force against protesters. They called protesters terrorists. Isn't that funny? The terrorists called the protesters in Ferguson terrorists. That's akin, you know, they said stuff like, you know, there will be consequences for your violence against the peaceful, law-abiding citizens of Missouri. That's what the KKK said in their flyers. There will be consequences for your violence against the peaceful, law-abiding citizens of Missouri. You know what that's like saying? That's like saying we must kill them before they kill us. Isn't that exactly what I said that the preparation stage of genocide is? Is indoctrination? Indoctrinate the, the population with fear? Tell them stuff like uh, they will kill, they will kill you, they will impregnate your, your daughters. They, you know, we, 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 we had to kill them before they kill all of us. That's exactly what the KKK did in Ferguson. They made the protesters terrorists and then said that the consequences of their terrorism slash their rioting will be violence against the peaceful, law-abiding citizens of Missouri. That's exactly like that's exactly the KKK saying to white people in Missouri, we got to kill them before they kill us. Now let's go buy a Starbucks and get a latte. The eighth stage of gentrification is persecution. And when you look at persecution as it relates to the case study that we're currently talking about, which is Ferguson in the aftermath of the Mike Brown murder by the police officer, so-called police officer, Darren Wilson. The eighth stage of, of genocide being persecution is where victims are identified and separated based on identity. Once you're identified, you can be segregated into ghettos, deported into concentration camps, confined to famine-stricken uh, regions, and basically starved out. When you look at Ferguson, in light of persecution, gentrification has its clear target. They separated the people down just solely on racial identity. They forced the people into those segregated areas, the ghettos, the prisons, which I also call concentration camps. Ghettos and prisons are concentration camps. And in those areas, I can assure you, there's huge, massive food deserts going on where the people aren't getting access to good food, if at all. So the people in Ferguson are persecuted, and that w that's what was going on in Ferguson at the time of Mike Brown's murder and in the aftermath. So we move to the ninth stage of genocide as it relates to Ferguson at the time and in the aftermath of the murder of Mike Brown. The ninth stage of genocide is extermination. Essentially mass killing. The exterminations occur because they don't see the victims as fully human. And when in conjunction with the state, in terms of the, the militaries, the militias, and stuff like that, those are the vessels that do the killing. So your police, your military, remember I said, and you should remember this, Ferguson had the police departments were, were decked out with military, with, with war-style weaponry, you know, the, the military was, in fact, brought in. 
along with the police, the Oath Keepers, those vigilante white boys, they were involved, and they were allowed to walk around with impunity and act with impunity. The police never said anything to them. No surprises here. So a lot of these killings, because they happen across the continental U.S., you see them as kind of isolated individual killings. But when you, you have to look at the U.S. as a whole, stop looking at it as 50 states. Look at it as a whole. As a whole, this is a ma- these are mass killings of black people. But even if you do look at it as individualized or isolated or seemingly isolated killings, it's still a prelude to something bigger. Whites and their militias don't see you as human, or at least not fully human. Remember the old law that said blacks were three-fifths of a man? You know, that's never been revoked or repealed, or whatever the word is. They still see you as three-fifths of a man. And that's why it still stands in in law. Or at at least it still stands in thought. So malicious carry out, you know, these isolated killings of unarmed black Citizens, so-called black, so-called citizens, because I don't know if black folks are really citizens in this place anyway. Sometimes, because remember when I talked about extermination, the ninth stage of uh, genocide. Remember, I did mention that when these state-sanctioned militias and stuff do the killing, you can have revenge killings. So Ferguson is an example. Sometimes. There are a few, seemingly at least, revenge killings. When all these killings were occurring, a few people, a few brothers, stood up and went after cops in return. I think Micah Johnson in Dallas. I think that was in 2017, actually. Well, maybe, maybe it was 2016. I, I'm kind of forgetting now, but Micah Johnson went after some cops in Dallas, and they cornered him somewhere, and they blew him up with a bomb attached to a robot. You've never heard that happen before. All the Dylan Roofs, all the, um, this guy recently whose name I, I didn't even pay attention to, some psycho savage, who I think it was in Houston, actually, was sending out these bombs to people, and they tried to claim it wasn't racial and all that shit. He blew himself up. In these school shootings, they often take the white boy alive. The the white boy who was shooting up the movie theater in Colorado some years ago, they took him alive. I, I still see his crazy ass glare in pictures to this day. But for Micah Johnson, they made a statement to you. Like they made statements to the MOVE organization back in the day. They will blow your ass up. And that's supposed to make you afraid. That's done to make you afraid. So what are you going to do about that? I want you to think about that. What are you going to do about it? In the 10th stage of genocide, we have denial. Now remember, this whole conversation in today's podcast was brought on by the fact that there was this incident at Starbucks and... Two black men, within two minutes of arriving in the Starbucks, were surrounded by police. I played the interview from Good Morning America, 
with Robin Roberts talking to the two black guys who were who were electric sliding all past the idea that it was about being black and all and you know shit like that. They were just just dancing around it. You see, sometimes the denial is not only from the dominating force, but oftentimes the, the, the denial is by the victim as well. In fact, they really have taught black folks to think of racism last when these type of incidents occur. And religion, in particular, going back to Darius's question on Facebook, make sure to follow us on Facebook. Religion is what is one of the things that is key to our denial. We are so afraid, are so brainwashed against thinking that people are actually evil. that we'll attribute it to some demon, some, some devil, which wasn't ever in African spiritual systems. There was no devil. These people are the devils. The evil is from them. It's their savage nature, like I talked about in my last broadcast. Added upon that, their ego and their savage nature, it's all on them. They're savages, and you need to call them and identify them for what they are. Stop denying it. Because they're already denying what they're doing to you, and I, of course they would. If they admitted it, it might wake a few of us up. So like I said, the 10th stage of genocide is denial. And when you apply that as a case study to Ferguson. You see where jurors, in all of these types of cases, like Mike Brown, they let these killers off all the time. They pay families off not to speak out or, or to protest, or to go out there and tell the protesters to stop protesting. They paid him off to keep quiet. What happened to that kid in Chicago? What was his name? Laquan McDonald? That murder happened about a year before we knew about it. And come to find out, they had paid the family some $5 million to keep quiet. They don't want, um, what's this uh, conscious pimp called again? What's his name? Uh, the one taking backshot selfies and shit. Uh, what's his name? He used to roll with James Brown back in the day. Had a perm like him too. Al Sharpton. In fact, it's been known they pay Al Sharpton to deny certain things or to, to sit out of certain protests. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a denial game and you help with the denial because you deny it first. I've talked about this before, but I remember watching this documentary where this, these white boys grabbed this black kid from by his house, took him out into the countryside, beat the shit out of him, killed him, brought him back to, to, to town, hung him in a tree next to the front porch of his family, they had to wake up in the morning and see their dead family member lynched, badly beaten, disfigured. And in the court case, one of the white boy savages says to the mother of the deceased, I'm sorry, and I hope one day you can forgive me. You know, he was trying not to get the chair. And this old mammy says to that white boy without missing a beat, son, I've already forgiven you. You motherfucker. You're someone's mother 
and you give you you're somebody's mother and you give forgiveness, you give some solace to your son's murderer, brutal murderer, this fucking savage white boy, you just, without missing a beat, you already thought about what you were going to say, you already thought about giving him forgiveness, and some of you black folks are just fucking ridiculous. And I've had people tell me on Facebook when I've, when I've brought up that story or pointed out um, the instances again in like Walter Scott's case and this, that, and the other. Well, you know, they, they just want to give that forgiveness so it could take some of the weight off of their heart. Bullshit. That ain't taking no weight off of you. You lost your child in some nonsense like that, having been murdered, and you think uh, telling someone, it's all right, I forgive you, all those jackasses who stood up in court when Dylan Roof was being, w went before the judge after being caught, and they talk about you, y you took something away from us, but we forgive you, you asshole. You asshole. Because now you've given these motherfuckers permission to keep doing it. Once you, once you, the victim, deny what's going on, along with their own denial of what they're doing, you're just setting the stage for more genocidal massacres. What are y'all doing? Are you really going to tell me that you can't see this? Are you really going to tell me that is all a joke to you? Yeah, boy. Um, Starbucks moving down there, you know. Um, Starbucks would be nice, but let me tell you something. Once you see that Starbucks shit going on, and once you see what Starbucks is now doing, like they did these two uh, bug dancing Negroes the other day, that's the, all of that is the heralding. All of that is the mocking of what's to come. And that's your end. And all a lot of you are going to do is deny it. That's what you're going to do. A lot of you are going to deny it. A lot of you are going to kick the ball down the road and maybe your kids can, can do the fighting. Maybe your grandkids can do the fighting. You sorry motherfuckers, boy. You sorry motherfuckers. The time is now. The time is now to meet force with force. If the so-called Jews had it to do again, the regular everyday, average Joe, Jew, had to do it again, I'm sure they would have fought back way earlier. They would have probably assassinated Hitler way earlier. They would have recognized the signs of the us versus them, the little coded languages, the discrimination, the persecution, when they saw the signs, the early signs of it, they would have done something. I bet you, you give them a chance, they would have done something way earlier. In our mafia from, from Africa, there wasn't a Starbucks. Back then, they planted a flag and proclaimed the shit to some king or queen for wherever the fuck they came from. Today, you have these things. The Starbucks, the Whole Foods, the Trader Joe's, you have that stuff to let you know, but how about you even stop that from even happening? I want you to think about those 10 stages of genocide. I want you to think about how I applied it to Ferguson. I know Ferguson might be a little bit dated, but Ferguson is significant in the last few years within the black community. And we have to 
learn from what's going on around us. We have to identify what's going on around us. In recent weeks, I've been attending some meetings when I can of a group. I'm not going to say the group's name, but right now they're here in Brooklyn and they're fighting against gentrification. They have identified that a a corporate bank is buying a property in the neighborhood and all sorts of white folks are now moving into the neighborhoods. Black businesses are exiting. And they're trying to do something on a grassroots level, but they're also trying to affect policy change. They're trying to show that What's called gentrification is just a fancy word for ethnic cleansing, which is genocide. And they're trying to do something legally to counteract this so-called gentrification. They have events that they do. If I ever get their permission, if I ever seek to get their permission, I will let you guys know who aware, not necessarily via this podcast, but we'll talk. And if you're interested in, if you're in the New York City area, you're interested, send us an email at bitter.medicine.podcast at gmail.com. Maybe I could talk to them and get you on the mailing list. But the reason why I'm not putting their names out here, their locations, is because You have agents out here. You have saboteurs out here. And I'm not going to be the the guy who brings them in. But movements like this need numbers. They need numbers. Where do you like all the tenants of the group or whatever who's doing the work? They need numbers. Because gentrification is indeed ethnic cleansing. It's indeed genocide. So why not organize now to find a way to push back against this? Because by the time it gets to the gas chambers, the firing squads, It's too late. And because of our because we're being persecuted persecuted based on race, we don't get to hide. We don't pull some little beanie off our head and get to hide amongst a dominant society. We don't get to change our name and build wealth and make sure that that shit never happens again covertly. We're seen from a mile away. So we have to do things in a different way. We have to organize to prevent it from happening. We can't worry about creating sympathy later on. That's too late. Before I go, let me remind you that I have the Bitter Medicine blogs at www.bittermedicineblogs.com. We always need bloggers. We are open to vloggers, people doing video blogs. We need your presence. Black businesses, advertise with us. At least let me know of your existence. I'll give you a free business shout out. But if you want to actually advertise your products, and services, we can reach an agreement, email us at this email address I mentioned before. We're on YouTube, people. Our shares on YouTube, our, our, our listens are not what they should be. They're not what they should be, and that leads me sometimes to be a little bit inconsistent. I need you guys to share this show around. I need you guys to subscribe to our 
channel. Subscribe to our podcast on whatever podcasting platform you listen to podcasts on. I just talked about something and I gave you an, a real world example that you all should remember. Something that shows you what's going on around you. I tied it into current events in terms of Starbucks and those two black guys who were arrested. This is a message that should be more widely spread. This is a message that there should be more engagement under these podcasts when I post them to YouTube or SoundCloud or what have you. There should be more engagement. I should have way more retweets. I should have way more likes. And I'm not talking about popularity shit. I'm talking about people who get it, who understand, who understand that it needs to be put out there more. And we're not just giving anecdotal evidence. Oftentimes, you listen to my podcast, I get into it. I get into the science of things. Don't be these guys out here who, who are just talkers, are just personalities who talk, but they can't really get deep on nobody. They can't really break it down and show you the facts. Because when you're talking about these these fucking savages, you got to hit them with facts, learned thought. So I'd like to see more engagement. More, If you have a black business, talk to me more. I'll put you on. I have no problem. Unless you're afraid of black nationalism. And any black person who's afraid of black nationalism, we shouldn't support that person anyway. Maybe that's what you're afraid of. Maybe that's why you don't want me to talk about your business on my show. But that's stupid. White media talks about these heralds of, of gentrification all the time. There's always some Starbucks commercial ad. There's always some Whole Foods shit around, some Trader Joe's shit around. They're proud of being white nationalists. They're proud of being organized. Why are you not proud of it? This is as good a place as I need to get a shout out, and it's for free. Unless you want to start talking about specific services and products and stuff like that, then you can email us, and even that won't be no big cost to you. Lastly, I have a GoFundMe. I've talked about this before. I've only had a handful of people donate, and that's sad. Because there are those of you who do listen on a regular basis. And I'm not asking for much of you. Meanwhile, a lot, a lot of these conscious hustlers and pimps are getting $300 from one person. Fifty dollars from one person. They come out. They do a live show, and they get. They walk away with a thousand of your dollars in one live show. Where they're talking about not much of anything really, and just saying the same thing over and over. White supremacy. White supremacy. White supremacy. But no solution. So, in the comments down below, um, I want you to talk about, I want you to pick your three strategies against gentrification, your three solutions against gentrification, against ethnic cleansing, against our ultimate genocide, which is where these folks are, are taking us. I want you to post that below. I appreciate those of you who regularly listen to us, who have subscribed to our channels, who are subscribed to us on various platforms and social media, like SoundCloud and Twitter, etc. For those of you who 
listen but you don't subscribe, I want you all to change that today and subscribe. Um, This has been the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Also subscribe to our parent radio station, KWAZ Radio. We're on there on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Okay, you could find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook as well, SoundCloud, etc. Okay, so until next time, thanks for listening, and uh, peace be with you. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.